Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the opportunity that we have to feast upon your word. I just ask you would seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth. Filter out any foolishness, but just seal to our hearts that which you would have us receive. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were at verse 18, I believe, of chapter 14. We looked at the fact that God's kingdom is not meat and drink. I want you to remember that this chapter started out that that we are not to receive each other for doubtful disputations, arguments over scruples personal convictions and so the subject of this chapter has not been doctrine but scruples the entire 14th chapter we've already been given a, an amazing amount of doctrine in 13 chapters though the strong and the weak uh, differential is not doctrine but personal convictions it, it is in fact a chapter that alludes to doctrine for everything in the 14th chapter of Romans uh, makes no sense if we're not fully aware of the doctrine that we've had for 11 chapters if that makes any sense We are totally dead in sin, totally unable to do anything to remedy our condition. And in that condition, when we were God's enemy, when we weren't seeking him, when we weren't loving him or serving him, he reached out and he died in our place. And we are born from above by his will, not by ours. So he died in our place. And God's kingdom is not scruples. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. He that in these things serves Christ, that is, in the Word of God, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, inseparable from God's Word. You do, you do not have joy in the Holy Spirit because you have some ecstatic experience. The joy in the Holy Spirit comes from this book. The Holy Spirit ministers to us through the Word of God. And there's far too much emphasis placed today, I believe, on experiential thought rather than doctrinal thought more and more the church that calls itself the church of jesus christ has become more a church of feeling than of doctrinal fact your joy in the holy spirit is based on your fellowship with him in the word of god and for he that in these things serves christ is shown as approvable to men it is not that in these things men will think you're great not you know not at all the text is saying that if in these things you serve Christ then you've been put to the test and shown to be approvable for men you know that that means a lot of funny Christian scruples are not really that which is approvable in the sight of men and so We'll continue on through this 14th chapter. What I find amazing, one of the most amazing things, is, is, is it's not often that you see an entire chapter devoted to one particular subject, and it appears that that's what we see here in chapter 14. And so, folks, I mean, you, we got to take notice. It, it had to have been important enough to God. You know, you wouldn't think that, you know, 
may, perhaps God would have said, well, I know, you know, there's going to be the matter of just scruples. And, and so, you know, maybe I shouldn't even mention it. Anyway, let's go on. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, things wherewith one may edify one another. And, you know, there have been several famous cases where ministers have been put on trial by church councils because they've interfered with a peace that ought to be there among brethren. And they leave out the part, you know, wherewith one may edify one another. If there's to be a real service for peace, it has to be based in that in which others can be built up and that's biblical doctrine. And I say, without apology, I'm persuaded that every year, the longer we go before Christ returns, because it, it does appear to just be snowballing now even, that biblical doctrine becomes less and less important. It becomes less and less a facet in modern Christianity. In fact, a couple of uh, noted theologians have said that they don't think that the tide can be reversed. I've, I've touched on my feelings concerning the apostasy in previous videos. But anyway, that's not my problem. My problem is whether or not I stand fast on what I believe the Word of God teaches. And that is based on doctrinal truth, not feeling. The way people are built up is in biblical doctrine. They're not built up because you're kind to them. They're not built up primarily in any way because of what you do, but because of what you teach. Remember in Matthew, by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be judged. Doctrine. People are built up by doctrinal truth. O Timothy, take heed unto doctrine, for in so doing thou shalt s deliver thyself and them that hear thee. That's what we want to do. Edification is built up in the Word of God. Verse 20, For meat destroy not God's work. It is God's work. Let's stop for a moment, folks. We know how God created in six days, rested on the seventh, and we, 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 most of us have a pretty good idea of what he created each day. Which one of you would have set about to try and destroy what God created? Destroy the work that he did? I mean, it's, it's unthinkable. Is it not? Unthinkable. Wouldn't even enter our minds. And here we're told in verse 20, for meat destroy not God's work. It's God's work. It's wonderful. It's wonderful by the grace of God to realize that you are God's work. And we look at other Christians and we say, you know, well, no, no, no Christian would do that. Do you realize that every Christian that you fellowship with is God's work? People have said to me, you know, how can it be that the church has departed so far from doctrine? You know, are we going to say that all modern Christianity is going to hell? Well, I'm not going to say that. Do we then say that God isn't working in them to will and to do of his good pleasure? But, well, he, he, but he's doing that in yours in your life. Surely you wouldn't say that. Some of my dearest friends are miles from me on some of the things I believe in and some of the things I do, but they're surely with me on the deity of Christ, the substitutionary death of Christ, the grace of God. So when you deal with someone else in the area of scruples, bear in mind that they are they also are God's work. 
our chapter is going to end that if it isn't of faith, it isn't. If it's not of faith, it is sin. To him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. There's clearly a connection in the 14th chapter between uncleanness and sin. If you esteem it to be unclean and you still do it to you, it is sin, even though the thing itself isn't unclean. And I would argue don't do it. But don't push that scruple on everybody else. There is nothing unclean of itself. Now, please, don't apply that to the doctrinal area, and that's what many people do. You know, hey, I got a text. The scripture says nothing unclean of itself. So it's not unclean for me to believe that Jesus Christ was the offspring of some German soldier who raped Mary. Now we're way out of the area of scruples. The, the things that are not unclean are the practices of Christians, not doctrinal truths. But if you esteem it to be unclean, it is. So why should you tear down God's work? Oh, it can't be God's work. This person has some silly idea, you know, that something's wrong. You can't do that. If they think it's wrong, to them, it's wrong. And if you don't think it's wrong to you, it isn't wrong. But to force them to, to, to criticize them, to put a stumbling block in their way, is what this chapter argues against. Don't tear down God's work. Everything is pure, but it is evil to the man who thinks it's evil, the one who discerns it's evil. Now we have to look at the 20th verse very carefully. It is evil for that man who eats with offense. What that verse is saying is that you, the strong person, who believes it's perfectly all right to eat bacon, is it doctrinally right or wrong? Well, it has nothing to do with doctrine. It's the area of personal conviction. I started this chapter by saying that the chapter deals with scruples but this chapter ends by saying that anyone who operates absent from faith is sinning. What this chapter says is that it is evil for that man who eats with a stumbling block. That is that the strong man put a stumbling block in, in his area. Oh, Steve, oh, come on. You know, I know how you feel, but boy, you got to go fishing this Sunday with me. And, and you drag them down to the riverbank. Now, uh, maybe that's a poor illustration. The, but the text clearly indicates that somebody, not the person eating, but somebody put a stumbling block in his way. And whoever that is, he's tearing down God's work. Yeah, it can't be God's work, you know, that somebody thinks it's wrong to play cards. You know, I see you playing cards. Uh, that, that can't be. I see you playing poker, and, man, I just, no, that, that's not God's work. You know, uh, My mother thought it was wrong, you know, to play cards. I, I, I don't know whether my dad did or not, because in those areas, my dad kind of went along with my mother. But there were other areas where he didn't, but no Christian with any sense of biblical truth would think it's wrong to play spades. Maybe bridge, okay, right? But surely not spades. And if I said that to my mother, I got in trouble. But my mother was the one who would tell me that, that no Christian would go to a movie. You know, same thing. She didn't She didn't see it as the same thing because, you know, I was a lot smarter than she was. I hope you took that in a, in a sense in, in which I said it. But the verse is saying that it is not right for you, the strong person who thinks there's absolutely nothing wrong with whatever this thing is, to put a stumbling block in the path of the weak who thinks there is something wrong with it. Well, that, that weak person is God's work. 
you know, and the question comes up, I hear it all the time. Why is it that so many Christians have such a small comprehension of biblical doctrine? And I conclude it's God's work. And, and I get in trouble for that. But I have to believe that, folks. I have to. Because God is also working in them. And we're not all on the same page. We're not all, all on the same level of spiritual growth. We don't have the same knowledge. We don't have the same faith. God is working in them. The temptation is to think that, you know, God's not working in that, in that person, in that person's life. That is wrong. It's just absolutely wrong. God wouldn't have Peter think that, that God's not working, that he wasn't working in the life of John. Or, or, or John think that, 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 that he wasn't working in the life of Peter or James? I mean, come on. Let's think about it. This, this whole chapter is devoted to that. It's, it's not that, that complicated. It seems to me like it's a whole lot stronger to believe that God expect. Oh my, what a mess it'd be. You know, if God just left it to us to, to take and judge one another, discern one another, one, one another as to whether or not they were, you know, and, and man, this is where I'm at, so this is where you got to be. Are you kidding me? And this is kind of a sensitive area for me because I'm involved in the ministry quite heavily. And I, and I, I'm, I talk to a lot of people. There's a difference, folks, between doctrine and scruples. And this, this chapter is primarily dealing with personal convictions, scruples. So I conclude God's working in their life, same as mine, and I get in trouble for that. But, you know, I, I have to believe that because God is also working in them. And we're not all on the same page, okay? Spiritually speaking, it is God who works in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's that's not just to some of you elite Christians, okay? All right? I believe it to be true of every member of his family, from the least to the greatest. And when we get to glory, we will not rejoice because we had a good grasp of biblical doctrine and... Well, so-and-so didn't. We'll rejoice because salvation is of the Lord. You know, I don't know what God's doing in your life, but I am absolutely certain that God has designed it so that we realize that it is not by our strength nor by our might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. If we were all right now like Christ, if we were all where we're trying to get everybody else, why, why ever, if we were right now where everybody else is trying to get everybody else to be, we wouldn't need Christ. All we like sheep have gone astray and God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Every single one of you who rejoice in the person and the work of Jesus Christ is God's work. And every single one of you who doesn't is God's work. I wouldn't tear you down for anything in the world. I will fight with every fiber of my being against the diminishing of biblical doctrine, the sovereignty of God, the importance of his word, I know a sovereign God who's declared that he works all things after the counsel of his own will. And that is not only true in my life, it's true in yours. And it's true in the life of every Christian you meet. Don't put a stumbling block in their path. And that stumbling block is in the area of personal scruples. It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine or anything whereby thy brother is caused to stumble, made to fall, or is made weak. Now, now one could take that 
and, and say, well, this is totally against the strong guy and totally in defense of the weak, and it's not that. What that text is saying is just what the previous verse said, only it emphasizes it. It's good not to do anything that puts in the path of another person a stumbling block. This is not a doctrinal stumbling block. They believe it's wrong to do something that you're per perfectly content to do, you're perfectly happy with. Neither one of you are wrong. If he thinks it's wrong to do it, in his mind, that's correct. To him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. That is correct. If you don't esteem it to be unclean to you, it is not unclean, and that is correct. The text is not saying we shouldn't do those things. The text is saying don't put a stumbling block in the brother's way. That works both ways. The weak can put a stumbling block in the path of the strong. You think it's all right to do that? Well, let me tell you why it isn't. And he'll, you know, he'll come up with 50 reasons why you shouldn't drink Coke or whatever. There's all kinds of scruples. That's putting a stumbling block in the path of the strong, or the strong can easily put a stumbling block in the path of the weak. You know, you're crazy. Only a fool would believe what you believe. And we're not to do either one of those things. You trust God. Have it to thyself before God. My Bible says, Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. Don't make more out of it than it, than it is. The word happy means fortunate. It means a lot more than happy. Fortunate is the man that doesn't condemn himself in what he allows. And once again, please, you got to differentiate this from doctrine. You can't say, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't believe Jesus Christ is God, and I'm happy in that. that. That's not what that verse is saying. These are things, things. A man is very fortunate who doesn't judge himself in that which he allows. Think how unfortunate the man is if he thinks it's wrong to chew tobacco and he chews tobacco. Well, so well, so he's going to sit there, a spitting and condemning, you know, himself, uh, feeling guilty, and yeah, you know, just sit there spitting and condemning himself, and spitting and condemning himself, judging himself the whole time, right up to the last spit, you know, and beyond. Not very fortunate, not very blessed, not very happy. It's not hard for me to imagine God on the day of judgment asking that person, well, why'd you do that? You know, didn't have to do that. What a wonderful thought to know that you belong to God because of the personal sacrifice of Jesus Christ and to walk through your life never condemning yourself when God has nothing against you. You know, in my ministry, I've had many a conversation with people who were more concerned about things than they are biblical doctrine. And folks, I'm not. I don't care what you do, but I'm greatly concerned about what you believe. You know, because you people all sin. You know, you live terrible, terrible lives. But it's God who in his grace reached down and touched your life, made you a new creation in Christ Jesus. And Christ made it very clear that if you're going to talk about judgment, you're judged by what you say, not by what you do. Yet I've had many a, a person over the years discuss things which to me are, are of no importance whatsoever and completely ignore the grand doctrines of the truth of God's word. They're not interested in that. And I have to leave that to God. You have certain ideas about your personal convictions. Have them to yourself and to God alone. Any one of you is fortunate if he lives by his own convictions. And so the chapter closes. He that discerns anything to be wrong is judged if he eats. 
God made it very clear that in these things, he expects you to live according to those convictions that you had before him. You believed it was wrong to go to movies, and God someday says to you, you know, how'd you live? Well, I went to movies. Well, he says, you weren't very fortunate then, were you? Fortunate is the man who doesn't condemn himself in that which he allows. For the one who's made that judgment, he that doubts, he who, he who has made such a judgment is condemned already if he goes ahead and does it because he didn't do it in faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And I, I know that at least on one occasion you people have heard me say that if I believe anything, I believe that what God desires most of us is that we trust him. Imagine you and me who are redeemed by the death of Jesus Christ. New creations, members of the same body, not even willing to talk e to each other because, you know, I call it the Lord's Supper and you call it the communion table. I mean, really? You know, or, or because I'm fishing on your Sabbath and, and well, you know, you're fishing on mine. I mean, seriously? You know, or because you smoke cigarettes and, well, I only chew tobacco. You know, fussing and fighting over which one of us is more righteous than the other, when doctrinally, <laughs> doctrinally, hello, doctrinally speaking, we've both already been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Why should your focus be on someone else's sin when whatsoever is not of faith is sin? Do you know how much faith that person has? Are all the areas in which God has invested faith in that person's life? Are you aware of that? Do you have that knowledge? I doubt it. You focus on somebody else's sin when whatsoever is not of faith is sin and you don't have all faith? You yourself? None of us have all faith. We are governed by, by the, the principles of grace, not law. Stop passing judgment on one another. We cannot determine with absolute certainty who is Christ's and who is not. And we certainly can't determine with absolute certainty who's, well, I don't know how to put this, folks. It's just we, we tend to look at people, and if they're not going in the direction that we're going, there's something wrong with them, and that is wrong. That's just wrong. And if we were all like Jesus Christ today, we wouldn't need Christ. The only reason we are at the level of maturity that we are, any one of us, is by grace. Nothing is credited to self. And this and a thousand and one other truths are meant to give us peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. And that includes our knowing that we can be content always, every day, be content with his progress concerning our spiritual growth at every stage of its development. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.